Well, a very warm welcome to our Paul John live feed to Goa, India. Really excited about the new releases that we have in front of you tonight. The new Nirvana, PX cask, Oloroso cask and Methuna. Uh, a lovely new lineup here and a uh, very warm welcome to everybody all over Australia, wherever you're joining for us. Good. Hope you're all well. Sharp hands. How are you? Good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Now, before we get underway, I've, uh, I'm gonna, gonna admit a bit of, bit of man love here. Uh, Michael D'Souza, the head distiller and master blender at Paul John has joined us tonight. How are you? Actually, good afternoon to you, Michael. How are you? Good afternoon. How are you? Really well, thank you. Great for you to join us. Now, for those of you who don't know, uh, just over five years ago, this gentleman made the, the trip to Australia and he visited us in Tasmania uh, to show us uh, the new releases of, of Paul John, the, the core range. And uh, it quickly became one of our best-selling brands and one of our most loved brands. So it is a, it's a great privilege to, to be able to show you these new releases tonight. Michael, what have you got for us tonight, mate? Hi, <clears throat> hello. Um, let me uh, welcome uh, you guys. Uh, welcome to today's Paul John Whiskey Tasting. Uh, thank you for inviting me and thank you, thank you for taking uh, time out and being here today. Uh, I'm Michael de Souza. I work as a whiskey maker for Paul John Single Malt. Uh, during the session, I would be taking talking about the distillery, um, how different expressions and also how the maturation happens here in India. Uh, thereafter, I will hand over uh, the, uh, the baton to Pankaj. Uh, he would be taking the tour of the distillery and showing you around. Uh, to start with, uh, yeah, I mean, John Distillery is not many people know about us. Uh, started in 1992. Um, we were predominant uh, until 2006. Uh, we were mainly into blended whiskies. Uh, this is how the concept of Nirvana started. I will explain you about that. Uh, today, one of our flagship is selling more than um, uh, 50 million cases annually uh, in India. Uh, so, um, in 2006, uh, Paul P. John, he is the founder of the company. He decided to set up his own single malt distillery in Goa. Uh, Goa, not only, uh, you know, um, it's a touristic destination, it is also known for quality water. This is one of the reasons uh, we decided to set, set up the distillery here. Uh, when it comes to um, manufacturing, uh, we use Indian six row grain. Uh, uh, in India, grain is grown on the, um, in the northern part of India. Uh, you know, some people uh, grow their grain in the foothills of Himalayas, but our grain mainly comes from the place called Rajasthan, where the best of the barley is grown. So we use six row Indian grain. Um, so every day we use close to eight metric tons of grain to produce 4,000 liters of new made spirit. Goa, again, we have wonderful tropical climate wherein uh, the whiskey measures differently. I wouldn't say faster, it measures differently here in India. Uh, if you compare with other polar regions, uh, the extraction is four times higher here. I mean, I can, uh, I can say one year in India is equivalent to four years in Scotland or any other region, uh, which is colder in climatic conditions. Uh, the, our first expression was launched in 2012 um, uh, in the UK. Since then, um, for a period of time, we have released close to uh, 12 different expressions. Um, you know, I call it as expressions because our whiskies are NAs, that is non-A statement whiskies. We don't mention age on the label. So all our expression, all our whiskies are expressions. Today we have four different expressions, Nirvana, uh, PX and Oloroso, and of course Mitra. Uh, to start with uh, Nirvana, Nirvana is for those who are in transition from blended whiskies to single malt. In India, people drink a lot of blended whiskies, be it um, Johnny Walker, uh, Shivers, uh, 100 Pipers, Black and there are a plethora of uh, different blended whiskies here. 
So mm, the majority of the whiskies sold in India is blended whiskies. Um, so Nirvana is for those who are in transition from uh, blended whiskies to single malts, which is more affordable, easy drinkable. Um, you know, if you see, <clears throat> Michael, if I'm not mistaken, is, uh, is, India still the, is India still the largest consumer of whiskey in the world? Yeah, India is, I mean, okay, um, I wouldn't say whiskey, proper whiskey, but yes, I mean, uh, we have different categories, uh, something known as IMFL, Indian Made Foreign Liquor. Um, so yes, we are the largest producers and the consumers in the world. Um, so for Nirvana, uh, this is a three-year-old uh, single malt, uh, mature and ex-bourbon casks. I've used the second and third full whiskies in this. Uh, again, as for the international regulations, uh, we had to mature our malts for at least six, three years. So this whiskey is from the ex-bourbon cask. Uh, and um, we have three, four different warehouses. So it's the mix of uh, whiskies from all the warehouses. Yeah. So on the nose, you can see it is, it is very elegant. It is very fruity. A lot of, you, you get a lot of tropical fruity notes. Again, you know, certain flavors are synonymous across all Paul John expressions, especially, you know, tropical fruity notes, nuttiness, it could be peanut or hazelnut. You have a lot of honey, vanilla, you have citrus, you know, younger whiskies will have more yellow uh, fruit notes like lemon, lime. <clears throat> it's malty, you know, because it is young, it's malty. You have a lot of tannins on the nose. Um, Indian grain is smaller in size. This makes the husk content is higher. You know, the husk has got tannins. So tannin also imparts a lot of flavors. So on the nose, if you see, it is more tannic on the nose. <clears throat> so Nirvana is the only expression which is chill fil filtered among all the Paul John expressions. This is bottled at 40%. Um, so it obviously it is chill filtered. You know, um, we can't get away without chill filtering uh, when it is 40% because the Indian grain contains a lot of, it's more amount of protein more amino acids. So if you don't chill filter, you tend to make the whiskey hazy or even at some time you would find precipitations of fat. So this whiskey is chill filter. On the palate, again, it is very, very creamy. Though it is chill filtered, it is creamy and elegant. It is sweet, it is malty. Um, some people get, you know, uh, it is for, for some people it is chocolatey, some people it is fruity but it is highly malted whiskey. Um, in between, uh, if you want to know or understand anything specific about certain expressions or manufacturing process, please uh, feel free to barge in. Okay, uh, somebody is saying it, is, it has got new make flavor to it. Of course, I mean, it's not an old whiskey. Uh, it is just three year old. Um, again, um, if you compare with other Paul John expressions, uh, this is younger. Uh, and also this whiskey is from second and third fill cask. So the extraction that you get from the multiple fill cask is very, very less. Um, but as I said, this whiskey is for those who are in transition from single malt to, blend, I mean, the blended whiskeys to single malt. So that's it. Yeah, for me, it exhibits some of the fruits that you'd expect to find in a new make, but it doesn't have the harshness of a new make, that's for sure. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. 
So should we uh, continue uh, Todd? with the tours or yeah. Okay, my friend uh, Pankaj is uh, waiting to take you around the distillery. Uh, he, he would be showing around the visitor center and uh, the distillery. You can understand how the whiskey has been made uh, at Porto John. Um, later, you know, during the tour, you can jot it down. Whatever the questions you feel like asking later, I would be happy to answer you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Pankaj, uh, it's over to you. You are, you are muted. Can you unmute him, please, Adam? Let's go. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Michael, and a very warm welcome to all of you. My name is uh, Pankaj Puana. I look after the Vista Center here, but uh, more importantly, I love the whiskeys being made here. So today, it'll be my pleasure to walk you around the visitor center and also give you an overview of how the Great Indian Single Malt Whiskey, the Great Indian Single Malt Paul John Whiskey is made right here. So for starters, uh, we will walk through the Vista Center. So let me just explain the significance of the Vista Center that we have in here. In fact, a feast here rises on the first Vista Center in India. So no other whiskey distillery in India has a visitor center. So we are located in the southern part of the southwestern part of India, very specifically in Goa. For those of you who are not familiar with Goa, Goa used to be a Portuguese colony until 1960s. So we had to incorporate the influences into our Vista Center. That's when uh, we set up the distillery in 2009, but we set up the Vista Center in 2008. So the whole aim of setting up the Vista Center in India was to educate the consumers. So like my, Michael was mentioning, you know, most of the whiskeys in India are technically not whiskeys. In fact, you'd be surprised to find out that until 2018, we didn't have an authority in the country to check a call, to keep a check on the quality of alcohol. So it was only in 2018 for the first time in India, we had regulations on what makes a whiskey uh, or what makes a spirit brandy gin, so on and so forth for different types of alcohol. So that's the whole aim, the sole aim at the Vista Center to educate the consumers about what whiskey is, what makes a whiskey a single malt whiskey and different other aspects of it. So here at the Vista Center, as you can see, we have incorporated the Indo-Portuguese influences in here. So we hired a local architect, Mr. Dean de Cruz of Portuguese descent. So that's where we were able to pull this off. So a lot of visitors who come in here assume it's an old bungalow that we bought and we refurbished it, but no, we built it from the scratch. So again, this is a typical entrance of an old Goan home. If you've been to Goa before, you know what I'm talking about. So at the center, we offer multiple packages in the form of tours and tastings. So this is our lobby, wherein a uh, couple of interesting things, whatever furniture you see, it's all antique. We bought it and we refurbished it. And you'd come across a lot of other influences as well in the terms of uh, the paintings that you would see, the display units and other aspects of the furniture. So here we do have a cafe area, but right now it's not operational because we're directly above the car cellar. So that doesn't allow us to have a light counter or kitchen in here. But Soon uh, we'll be starting off with pre-cooked meals or cold cuts in here. So we do have a gift shop as well. This is a makeshift gift shop. Uh, remember I told you this is the first center in India. So a lot of policies had to be amended. And in fact, we didn't have a license to sell our whiskeys at the distillery up until this year. So now if you're in Goa and you're wondering where to pick Paul John whiskeys, do not worry, we've got you covered. So here at the gift shop, we do sell a lot of other bar accessories. In fact, we are the only offline store in India to sell Glencane glasses. We use Glencane glasses extensively here for our tastings as well. So again, different other uh, products, co-branded co products in here. And uh, yes, there are a lot of them who want to buy off our artifacts from the display. So we thought, you know what, might as well sell the artifacts here as well. So here we've got you covered. We sell a lot of uh, miniatures in here, whiskeys, Linking glasses, other bar accessories. So this is the lobby area that we have. And yes, uh, the fan does take away a bit of the attention as soon as the people come in here. And I'm sure most of you are aware of the conditions, climatic conditions that we have here in Goa. So the fan does uh, justify its existence in here. 
So just the panoramic view. You'll come across a lot of paintings in here as well, locally commissioned to an artist, uh, Miss Bianca Menzies. So it all begins here in the AV room, where we sort of give them a whiskey lowdown, like I mentioned on what whiskey is, what different types of whiskeys there are, and what makes a whiskey a single malt whiskey. So all in all, an Indo-Portuguese uh, style visitor center that we have. So like I mentioned, interestingly, there's a bottle of Paul John incorporated in all of the paintings that you see here. So after a long tour, we can also play some Where's Waldo in here with our paintings, sometimes have exciting competitions with that. So now that the whiskey lowdown is delivered, let's start off with the tour here. So Michael was mentioning that our parent company, John Distilleries, was set up in the year 1992. We are headquartered in Bangalore, which is the southern part of India, and we have over a dozen brands to offer in the market. So some of the brands we own are, would be Monk Castle, Grand Duke, Original Choice, Black Pelican. We are also into wines. We have Big Banyan wines, Ampersand wines, and Buona Port wines. So a little interesting fact, Original Choice that you see on your screen is one of the most sold whiskeys in the world. We did about 12.9 million cases of it a couple of years ago. And uh, yes, of course, I'm sure some of you may see some familiar brands in here as well, but tonight it's all about Paul John whiskey, so we'll stick to that. So in case you're wondering, where is Michael right now? So that's our sensory lab where all of the magic happens. And uh, I think Michael will talk about uh, the expressions we have a little later. So we have a chairman's cabin and the admin offices and the center again. So the distillery was set up in 2009 and we launched our whiskey for the first time in London in 2012. And ever since we have won close to about 300 awards. So it all began in the year 2013 when we won the gold medal at the World Whiskey Masters for Brilliance. The same year, four of our expressions were rated on upwards of 95 by Jim Murray in his Whiskey Bible, sort of catapulting us onto the global scenario. And it's been the same ever since. 2014 was no less. We won multiple awards at the Whis Wizards of Whiskey Awards, Whis Whiskeys of the World Masters. So we have won multiple awards in different parts of the country, like Malt Maniacs, which is based in Netherlands. We have won Oran Moore in Scotland, Michelangelo in South Africa. We've also won numerous awards at the Tokyo World Spirits Competition and multiple awards in San Francisco and Las Vegas competition. So in case somebody's interested uh, with the with the complete list of it, you can visit our website. We have the complete list of awards. So one interesting thing while we are here, this is the award that we won uh, for Mituna, which was recently adjudged the third finest whiskey in the world by Mr. Jim Moraine's Whiskey Bible. All right. So enough with the awards and the introduction. Let's get to the whiskey making. So there are a lot of factors as in that went into why our chairman, Mr. Paul John, decided that the distillery should be set up here in Goa. One thing. During his research, uh, Mr. Paul John, as well as Michael, they felt the whiskies that would rule the rosters for the next few decades would be tropical whiskies, fruity flor floral whiskies. So they felt with the tropical climate in Goa, it's definitely going to bring in those intricacies in our whiskies. One other aspect is water is an important ingredient in whiskey making. We work with around 90 to 100,000 liters of water a day. So thanks to us being in this part of the country, we have access to water. And the best part about the water here in Goa is that it's pretty much neutral on the pH scale. It's neither too alkaline nor too acidic. So it's easy for us to treat it. And uh, we use only demineralized water at every juncture of the process. And one other interesting fact is that Goa is the only state in India where we are allowed to sell our whiskeys above 50%. So a couple of select casts that we have at 55.2 and 55.5, You'd find them only in Goa, our international markets, and no other state in India. So legally, of course not. But if someone were to smuggle it, you can't help it. But yeah, we do not sell our whiskeys in any other state except Goa. So now we'll begin the distillery tour. I'm sure most of you have visited multiple distilleries. But one of the best things about doing a distillery tour is the different sets of smells that you come across. Because each process emanates different flavor profiles. So you cannot do it today. Until we find the technology for us to be able to do it, I'll try to explain what I'm smelling as I'm walking past different processes. So as I'm entering, I'm welcomed by this warm whiff of beer. It's nothing but the barley being fermented in here. So these are our fermentation wash bags. Very refreshing, very tempting. Probably after the tour, a glass of beer. All right. 
So it, we have three ingredients in our whiskey, barley, water, and yeast. Let's start off with the barley. As Michael mentioned earlier, we specifically use the six row barley. And one interesting fact is barley is grown only in the northern part of India. So we literally get our barley from the foothills of Himalaya. So one interesting aspect, uh, like Michael mentioned, was the usage of six row barley. Most of your distillers, be it in Scotland or other distillers in India, they prefer the two row barley, whereas we prefer the six row barley. What's the difference? Six row barley has got six shoots sticking out of its head, whereas two row barley has got two shoots sticking out of its head. But the more important difference is the six row barley has got a thicker husk due to which there's more protein in our barley. So what does that extra bit of protein do to our whiskeys? So it does give you those malty notes, so breakfast cereal notes, and also the buttery mouthfeel that you get in our whiskeys. We attribute it to the extra bit of protein that we receive from the barley. So we do not own any farms and we do not go to the farmers ourselves either. What we have done is we have outsourced it to a third party company, which is based in North of India. They procure the barley for us and then they do the malting as well. As most of you would be aware, barley has got starch, whereas we need the sugar. So to convert the starch into sugar, you need to activate the enzymes by germinating it. That process is known as malting. And it is during malting that we decide whether the whiskey is treated or untreated. So that malting, is also done by a third party agency. And based on our preference, if it's peated batch, they import peat from Scotland. If it's unpeated batch, they do the malting accordingly and then the barley is sent. So after we get the barley here, 40 sacks of barley is fed into the shoot, like you just saw it. And then it's taken up through the bucket elevator and the processes begin. For all of you geeks out there who are very particular about the number, it all begins with two tons of barley. All right, so let's figure out what two tons of barley is going to do to us and how many liters of spirit can we get out of it. So here, while we are here, I just want you to keep this in mind for later. These are our spirit receivers. At the end of distillation, we collect the new mixed spirit in here and it's intermittently stored before it's sent for maturation in a wooden cask. So in a way, process begins right there at the granary and ends right here at the spirit receivers. But as the cliche goes, the journey must go on and so shall we. The concoction of uh, smells in here, and a lot of malty notes, a lot of beer notes in here. So after we get the barley in here, it's fed into the chute. The first thing that we need to do is get rid of the stones and other impurities. So how do we do that? By passing it through this equipment. As you can read, I do not have to explain what it does. It literally removes the stones. So it all acts like a sieve, And there are also magnets in there to take away any metal bits if there are in the grain. Once that is done, the grain is then sent two floors up for the first process here which is milling. But before that, let's take a look at the different types of barley that we have, the peated and unpeated barley. So here we have uh, the samples of our barley, as you can see, it's marked as unpeated and peated. I do not know if you can notice it, but the peated is slightly darker in color and it's definitely smoky on the nose, whereas unpeated smells like any other regular grain. So here we import peat from two different regions in Scotland, the Highland as well as the Isla. While you're tasting the whiskeys, I'm sure Michael would tell you which expression uses peat from which different region. So now the malting or the first process in whiskey making is done by a third party agency and it's been sent to us. So we send the barley for it to be milled. So there's a particular grist ratio that we ensure when it's send it for milling. So what we need in our grist ratio here is 10% flour, 20% husk, and 70% coarsely ground grain. So this helps us in a lot of ways. One, it wouldn't clog up the mill. Because if we had gone for a complete flour-like texture, it would have clogged up the mill. And if we had done it too coarsely, the water would have just run through it without absorbing the sugar. So here, we use a roller mill, which is two floors up. 
unless you have x-ray vision, you won't be able to see it. But what you see is the grist hopper, which sort of acts like a funnel. And then the grist is sent into the mash tun. So we work with eight to 10 tons of barley a day. So with the help of the roller mill, we are able to pull off the consistency with every batch. So to repeat it, 20% husk, which also acts as an additional filter bed in the next process, which is mashing. 70% coarsely ground grain to ensure there's more starch to sugar conversion. So now malting has been done, milling has been done. We've got the grist in the desired ratio. It's time to convert the starch into sugar and extract the sugar for which we need the second ingredient in whiskey, which is our water. So we use groundwater in here. And like I mentioned before, it's all demineralized at every juncture of the process. So now, here, we've come to the third process in whiskey making, which is mashing. So this is a mash tun, which has a false bottom, which is perforated with slits and holes. And the rate that you see, it's submerged. It has blades and blades of different shapes and sizes at the bottom, keeps rotating, churns, and keeps the consistency of the mash. So now we've got two tons of barley, gristed to the ratio that we wanted. We add... 12,000 liters of water, but we'll not add it all at once. We'll add it at four, in four different cycles at four different temperatures. So the first part of water will be at about 65 degrees Celsius. We'll let it sparge for an hour, then 75 degrees Celsius, 85 degrees Celsius, and the fourth and the final sparge is at 95 degrees Celsius. So we vary the temperature between the sparges for the enzymes that have been activated during malting for it to break out. And by the time we hit 95 degrees Celsius, we ensure whatever little bit of sugar is left has been extracted. And whatever enzymes that helped us convert the starch into sugar, we, uh, it, we ensure that it's also killed. So the whole process takes about five to six hours. At the end of it, we collect the sugary syrup known as the wort, W-O-R-T. And we are left with the husk and the fiber that we do not have any use of, the spent grain or the draft. So what do we do with it? We get rid of it using the spent grain silo that you see outside. And we later sell it, sell it to dairy farm owners who use it as cattle feed. So we collect these productivity reports from these dairy farm owners. And uh, they say that ever since they've introduced this as a part of the diet of the cattle, there's been an increased productivity of milk. So in case you think that we're focusing only on making whiskeys, you're mistaken. We're also focusing, we are also focusing on our cows getting healthier here as well. All right. So now we've got the sugary syrup, the wort, all 12,000 liters of it. It's time to convert the sugar into ethyl alcohol, for which we need the third ingredient in whiskey making, the yeast. So the yeast that we use is distiller's yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. The strain of it is a secret. Only Michael would be able to tell you. So now we've got the fermentation area in here. About 14 fermentation washbacks. The capacities range from 16,000 liters to 18,000 liters. So now let's see what's happening in one of our fermentation wash packs. So we've got the wort in here and we've added about three kilos of distiller's yeast and it's aerially introduced and we let it ferment for about 60 hours. In that 60 hours, the yeast starts breaking the sugar into ethyl alcohol and there are numerous other chemical compounds. There's carbon dioxide, there's heat because it's an exothermic reaction. And more importantly, there are a lot of congeners being built in. Congeners are nothing but those chemical compounds that give us fruity floral notes in the form of esters. So at the end of 60 hours, the percentage of alcohol that's naturally being produced, it's at about 6 to 6.5%. So at the end of 60 hours, fermentation is done, but we are not done. If you've tasted our whiskeys before, you know they are fruity and floral. Part of the secret is that we let the distiller's beer or the wash rest for an additional 12 hours. So that's when more alcohol is not being produced but there are definitely more congeners that are being produced. So here are distillers beer. I already get the whiff of pineapple, a lot of citrus notes in here, lime, tangerine, get uh, mangoes, I get cashew, and yes, definitely smells like any good craft beer at the moment. So the only way to prove it is for you to come down here and taste it. So while we are here, I would like to invite all of you to go up. Whenever things open up or it's better, you can taste it here. So at the end of fermentation, 72 hours later, we collect about 11,000 to 11,500 liters of distiller's beer. The percentage of alcohol is low and there are a lot of chemical compounds that we need. So it's time to 
concentrate the percentage of alcohol and get rid of the chemical compounds that we do not need. So that's where the fifth process in, dis in whiskey making comes into play, the distillation. So for a whiskey to be known as single malt whiskey, one of the prerequisites is that we must use a pot still. So in the year 2008, when we set up the distillery, we just had the other two stills. The market's been fine. So a few years ago, we set up the other two stills as well. So here we have wash still, which is of 12,500 liter capacity. Then we have a spirit still, which is of 6,000 liter capacity. Here you see our condensers. Then we have the coolers for that additional bit of chilling. And what you see here is the spirit safe. So we use indirect source of heat in here. So there are stainless steel pipes in here through which we pass steam. And that's how we heat up the contents. So now we've got the distiller's beer in the wash still, and we start heating up the contents. The contents vaporizes, we condense it, we cool it down. And the first distillate that we collect is the low wine. So the low wine is full of impurities such as methyl alcohol and copper sulfate. And also the percentage of alcohol is at about 17 to 19. Obviously it's not gonna cut it as whiskey. So just to give you an understanding of what the low wine looks like, as you can see, cloudy, hazy, and there are some particles in it, indicative of the impurities present in it. So right now it, it still has some fruity notes to it, but there are also some metallic notes to it. So the low wine, we do not use it as is. So what do we do with the low wine? We send it to the spirit still for it to be distilled again. Yes, our whiskeys are double distilled, meaning they literally are being distilled twice. So now 3,500 liters of low wine is sent into the spirit still. We start heating up the contents. The contents will vaporize. We condense it. We cool it down. And when it gets here, this is the part where it gets exciting. So this is where we use the expression, the head, heart, and the tails for us to demarcate between what goes into the cask to become a whiskey and what we do not need. So the first batch that comes out of the spirit still will still have some impurities. I was talking about chemical compounds such as methyl alcohol the boiling point of which is lesser, far lesser than ethyl alcohol. So obviously we get those chemical compounds first, which we do not need. So we move the spout towards the head or the four shot section and we collect it in the fence receiver for now and we forget about it for now. All right. So every distillery has a benchmark for what they call the new make spirit or what makes the cut. So for us, there are two conditions. One, the percentage of alcohol must be between 55 to 75%. And second in the most unique condition, unique for the fact that I'm sure most of you have been to Scotland, but I can tell you that most of you wouldn't have seen this before, an open spirit safe. Because according to the Scottish regulations or the British laws, the spirit safe must be padlocked at all times with the access of the keys given to the customs officer, but we do not have that rule in here. So we can keep the spirit safe open. So that gives us an edge over our counterparts in Scotland. So where we are able to introduce sensory analysis. So Michael D'Souza, our master distiller, has trained the distillers working in here to smell, to taste, and only if they feel that it's got the consistency of a regular new make spirit, will they make the cut. So whatever we collect here goes to the spirit receivers that I showed you downstairs. And it's diluted to about 64% ABV before it's sent for maturation in a wooden cask. As you can see, a lot clearer than the low wines for sure, and viscous as well. So on the nose, you'd get a lot of uh, barley, raw barley, very sugary, sugar-like notes. And uh, yes, if you're a fan of grappa, trust me, you'll like this a lot, All right? So this is at about 65, 66% right now. So I'm not gonna take a sip of it. I've got half a day's work left. So now we've collected the spirit, the new mix spirit. It's time to get the whiskey its color and the flavors. As you can see, there's no color of the whiskey yet. And trust me, there are no flavors that we normally associate with our whiskeys. So where is it all coming from? You guessed it right, from the cask, from the wooden cask that we have. So let's head to the final process in whiskey making, which is maturation and blending. So we have over 25,000 casks at the distillery and it's divided between uh, four cask warehouses. So we have an underground cast cellar and we have three above ground cast warehouses as well. So 
This is our task warehouse too. So of the 25,000 tasks, uh, we have a lot of maturation tasks. We have finishing tasks and experimentation tasks as well. So warehouse two here, uh, it houses most of our maturation tasks in here. So pretty unique as to some of the single malt whiskey distilleries uh, you would see in Scotland, because most of them follow a dunnage method wherein they stack four to five casts on top of each other. But here we've given it a unique twist wherein we've gone for the bourbon style of racking. So with this, we have about 14 tiers of storage space and that enables us to create more flavor profiles. So with this, Michael is creating a lot of different flavor profiles to recreate an already created flavor profile or to create a new flavor profile. So the whiskeys maturing at the topmost tier would be completely different from the whiskeys maturing at the bottommost tier. So again, if you want to know more about the sweet spot that Michael has, of course, you'll have to visit the distillery here for you to know all about it. But for now, what I can tell you is about the cask. So these are our maturation casks, 200 liter American oak ex bourbon cask. 200 liter is the volume capacity of it. So it's your typical American standard barrel. We also work with a lot of hogs heads and uh, butts, but butts uh, mostly that we have would be of ex Spanish wine. So these are 200 liter American oak because of the wood that has been used is the American oak and ex bourbon for the fact that the cask used to, was used to mature bourbon before. I'm sure most of you are aware for it to be known as bourbon, one of the prerequisites is that it must be matured in unused but charred oak cask. So once we get them here, we do not char it. And if you're wondering uh, which are the bourbons that we work extensively with, uh, no guesses in here. For the past few years, we've been uh, working a lot with Buffalo Trace. But uh, before that, uh, yes, uh, we have uh, you know worked with numerous other famous uh, bourbons. So here, once we get them here, we do not char it again. We just gently wash away the remnants of the previous whiskey and we pour our new make spirit in here. So the number of times that we use our cask here would be thrice. So we have a first fill, second fill and a third fill here at the distillery. All right. So now a little interesting fact, a minimum maturation of our whiskey would be three years. That's Nirvana. Whereas for the flagship expression, Brilliance Edited Bold, the minimum maturation that we do is of five years. And whenever we talk about maturation, it is imperative to understand the angel share of the place. So the amount of alcohol that we lose to evaporation every year in a cask is known as the angel share. So in Scotland, they lose about 2%, 2 to 3% every year. Whereas in Goa, if you were to take this walk with me, you'd know how much I'm sweating in here. So you would know the impact it has on the spirit in the cask as well. So we lose up to 10% every year. 8 to 10% is the average. So that's a significant loss. And as Michael mentioned earlier, the level of extraction is such that one year in Goa is equivalent to four years in Scotland. So whiskey that's been matured for five years in Goa is as good as a 20 year old Scotch. And that's part of the reason why we never mention the age of our whiskeys. So if you've seen any Paul John single malt whiskey bottle, we never mention the age of our whiskeys. Like Michael said, to reach it, we believe in expressions and flavor profile than just an age or a number on the bottle. So this is about the maturation part of it. So a couple of interesting things that we do not do that our counterparts uh, do in Scotland. Most of them add color. We do not add any color in our whiskeys. So you can check the ingredients. We do not have an E150 or an INS150 written on it because we do not add color. Whatever color you see, it's all natural and from the cast. So we do not add any flavors. And uh, to reiterate what Michael mentioned, uh, all of our expressions with the exception of Nirvana, they're all non-chill filtered. I take it that most of you are aware of what chill filtration is. Usually, these big distilleries at the end of maturation, they empty the contents of the cask, they pour it into a container, reduce the temperature to sub-zero levels. And when you do that, there are a lot of chemical compounds that solidify. Turbidity is what it's known as. So what causes the turbidity would be your protein, your fatty acids in the form of long chain esters. So when that turbidity occurs, they filter it out using a filtration device, usually with cloth or paper filters, and they pour the clear whiskey into the bottle. So some of the experts feel that maybe 10 to 15% of the flavor profile could be lost from what you would have tasted in the cask to what you get in the bottle. But again, it's open for debate. I'm sure most of you have your own versions of chill filtration and non-chill filtration. So now that's about the maturation part of it. So I'll just uh, take you to the cellar. But interestingly, before we head to the cellar, I'm sure this is mentioned in a lot of uh, trivias. So whatever you see on the walls of the warehouse, most of them assume it's just carbon and soot in here. 
because it's an industrial area that we are in. But along with the carbon and soot that you see on the walls of the warehouse, there's also a fungi known as Baudonia compnia sensus. Alcohol evaporates, alcohol is in the air. So the fungi is actually feeding off the alcohol that's in the air and it's thriving here. So no matter how many times we paint it or we scrape it off, it's always back. You know, so if you look around all the plants and the buildings also, the buildings freshly painted, so we don't have the alcohol fungi. But if you were to look at the plants and all of it, it carries a more like stuff. That's nothing but your alcohol fungi. So if you suspect any of your friends of stashing large amount of alcohol, look for the fungi on the walls. All right. So now we are back into the center. So I'll just to pan out what we have in here. And while you're nearing the doors of the cellar, you know there's something magical in here behind these closed doors. So let's go find out what we have in here. Wow. A good half an hour here could get you lightheaded, but uh, yeah, I don't want to take that chance today. So here we have a finishing cast and our uh, experimentation cast as well. So what you see here are the ex-Spanish wine butts that we have. These are some historical casts wherein Michael went to these bodegas in Spain. He spent a couple of months and he handpicked these historical casts. Some of them are at least 55 to 60 years old. So these butts in here were used to mature Oloroso before and the butts behind these butts were used to mature the Pedro Jimenez. So we also have other series that's going on. In fact, we are probably one of the very few distilleries in this part of the world to have experimented with the virgin oak cast, the result of which was the third finest whiskey in the world. And we are also experimenting with a lot of other different types of finishes in the cast as well. So some of the oldest ones in here would be from 09. So you can imagine the extraction and the amazing flavor profile it could have. Hopefully Michael gets uh, us to taste all of it one of these days, the oldest cast soon. All right, so that's about the maturation part of it. So I think I've uh, taken away a lot of your time talking about the whiskey. Now, proof of the pudding, they say, is in tasting it. So over to Michael uh, for the tasting of the whiskeys. And I hope you had a wonderful tour. And in case you want a more detailed tour, like I said, it would be our pleasure to host you here in India and to take you around the distillery and, of course, sip on a lot of whiskeys. So thank you again. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Cool. <clears throat> Thanks, Pankaj. So it's time to uh, move on. Uh, uh, shall we move on, uh, uh, Todd? Thank you. That was so good. Cool. Um, so moving on, we have uh, three more expressions left. Uh, to start with, um, uh, Paul John select cast Oloroso, I mean, uh, PX cast finish. So, uh, like I said, uh, we have different expressions. PX is uh, one of these select cast uh, expression, a bottle at 48%. This is bottled at PX finish because uh, the casks are not from Herat, it is from Montilla. So since the, uh, these casks are not from Herat, we cannot classify this whiskey as sherry finished whiskey. Hence, we bottled it as Oloroso and PX finished whiskeys. This is a seven year old whiskey, five years in ex bourbon cask, two years in Oloroso, uh, sorry, PX butts. <clears throat> on the nose, you have a lot of dry fruits from dry figs, dry dates, apricot, dry resins. It is spicy on the nose. <clears throat> you get dark chocolate, coffee mocha.
Again, the delivery is very, very sweet. Chocolatey. It is slightly woody. You know, you have to remember this is seven-year-old Indian whisk. When I say seven-year-old, you know, this is equivalent to 30-year-old Scotch whiskey in terms of extraction. I'm not comparing the age. The amount of extraction that we get from the Indian climatic condition is very, very high. So <clears throat> this is equivalent to seven year, I mean, 30 year old Scotch whiskey. So anything above uh, seven to eight years, you know, it, it will start extracting more wood compounds. Uh, um, but since again, you know, uh, I've used uh, Oloroso um, PX parts from PX, but also you get a lot of woodiness. Um, so as long as the whiskey is in the in ex bourbon cask, you can you can maintain it. It will not get too woody. Once you take out from the ex bourbon cask, once you fill in the alternative casks, it will it will start getting woodier. So we have to be very very careful here. Any right. questions? <clears throat> Is this your yep. first? PX expression, or have you done a single cask before? Uh, no, um, this is our first PX expression. We haven't bottled it as single cask because uh, these are 500 liter uh, casks, you know. Uh, so not many people would like to have 600 to 700 bottles as a single cask. <clears throat> it's beautifully sweet. So again, uh, deliberately, uh, it is bottled as slightly woodier because, you know, in India, people, you know, like anything with age statement. So, um, you know, when they taste something woodier, you know, psychologically, they think the whiskey is old. When you say it is just seven year old, they think it is young. Got some beautiful flavor there, Michael. Look, nice and long, sweet, nice and viscous too. Lots of oils, long flavor profile. Any questions? <clears throat> no. Can we move on? Okay. Uh, the next one is uh, Oloroso Select Cask. Again, bottled at 48. Uh, similar whiskey uh, was used uh, in this as well. Um, but five year old ex bourbon, but filled in uh, Oloroso Hogshead. It's smaller casks. <clears throat> if you see, uh, this whiskey is the, the previous one was slightly elegant. On the nose, it was mellower. If you see this, you know, on the nose, it is more robust, more bolder, more spicier. You have a lot of <clears throat> spiciness coming through. You have nutmeg, you have nuttiness. Uh, again, a lot of dry fruits like resins, um, dry dates, dry figs, um, dry almond. The palate, again, it is very creamy, very sweet, very spicy, lot of dark chocolate. The best part is it's very, very creamy and very chewy. Todd, um, is this whiskey reminds you of a Tasmanian whiskey? <laughs> it, it Very does woody, yeah. old. It, it's a bigger expression, isn't it? A lot more of the oak influence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I enjoy it. It's quite nutty. Bigger cast. Right. So strangely, if you see this, this cask is smaller than the, the butt. It is just 250 liters. 
but if you compa comparatively, this is less woodier. Yes. And the pH was slightly more woodier. Yeah. It reminds me a lot more of an Australian whiskey. Right. <clears throat> Have you had much Tasmanian whiskey yourself, Michael? I love, I mean, I've tasted a lot of, I mean, I remember me and Todd traveling around uh, to different distilleries and tasting whiskey. <clears throat> he did say that Australians had a lot more cask influence. And yeah, compared to the Asian whiskies, yeah, I think that's, that's probably right. Which do you prefer, Michael, the PX or the Oloroso? Uh, um, two different whiskies, but I prefer Oloroso to uh, PX. Big flavor, big, big flavor. Mm. What do you reckon, Adam, PX or Oloroso? Yeah, look, the Oloroso is my preference as well. The first time I tasted them, which was about a week ago, maybe two weeks ago, uh, the PX was initially my favourite, but, uh, yeah, the Oloroso has since won out. Well, yeah. the Mathoon is my favourite. <laughs> Yeah, sounds like a segue there, Adam, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm not pushing anyone. Michael, what can you tell us about the Mithuna? Okay, <clears throat> the last but the least, uh, this is Mithuna. Mithuna is from the Virgin Oak cask, um, finished in ex bourbon. Um, it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's not a, a regular finish. Um, in India, again, whiskey matures differently and you get a lot of extractions, even from the ex-bourbon barrels. Uh, you can, then you can imagine, you know, uh, how much extraction you would get from the virgin oak cask. So this whiskey is just six years old, uh, four years in uh, virgin oak, uh, two years finished in ex-bourbon cask. Um, the very reason I was doing this was, uh, I wouldn't say this is by accident, but um, as for the American law, in order to call any whiskey a single molly, it has to be matured in a freshly made charred oak cask. So for America, we were uh, maturing a single malts in virgin oak casks. That's how it started. <clears throat> um, so initially uh, we were very skeptical, but you know, end of the day, after four years, it came out very well in order to save or preserve the, the core character of Paul John, uh, we had to refill the same whiskey in ex-bourbon casks. As, as I said initially, Paul John, or every, every distillery has its hallmark. Paul John has its own hallmark wherein certain flavors are synonymous across all the expressions, starting from the fruity notes to the nutty mess, citrus notes like breakfast, I mean, um, um, breakfast marmalade to lemon to lime. Uh, you have a lot of nuttiness. Uh, it can be peanut or hazelnut. You have honey across all the expressions. So in order to preserve these flavors, I had to <clears throat> shift the whiskey or the liquid into ex bourbon casks. So, four years in virgin oak and another two years in ex bourbon casks. On the nose, again, straight away, a lot of flavors, uh, robust flavors, like, you know, you have licorice, you have honey, you have orange, orange peel. <clears throat> on, the, on the palate, a lot of spice, a lot of vanilla. Um, you have a lot of tropical fruity notes, again, it is very sweet, very chocolatey. You have coffee mocha. You have <clears throat> you have citrus and um, honey. Uh, 
again, the finish, finish is the best here. Uh, you have very long finish. It goes on and on. It is creamy. Um, if you look at the color, you know, people think it is very, very woody. It is, um, it's not woody at all. Um, though it is from the, <coughs> it's from the uh, version of, it is not woody at all. Um, There's not many things that I agree with Jim Murray about, but uh, the Mithana is definitely up there in whiskey quality. That's incredible. First time I tried it, I hadn't thought about adding water, but just did then, and it handles water really beautifully as well, which is always the hallmark of an excellent whiskey. Mm -hmm. Did you enjoy adding water? Yeah. No, I've enjoyed it both ways. Okay. Michael? Yep. Did you model this whiskey on anything else you've had before? Uh, not really. Um, <clears throat> nothing like this. Incredible. So this is, uh, sorry? It's an incredible drink. It really is. It's so powerful. It's got a lot of sweetness and savory elements, but uh, yeah, the flavor just goes on and on and on. Good. And as I said, you know, um, initially I, I had just 200 casts to start with. Today, if you see, you know, since the time I, we have launched this, we have got um, close to uh, 2,000 version of casts, uh, you know. So can we expect to see something like this again in the future? Uh, definitely. Um, uh, not in the uh, regular expressions, but definitely uh, some of the uh, special releases. Um, we have, I'm working on uh, the next uh, Zodiac series. Uh, so uh, could be the next Zodiac series. Yeah. Can you enlighten us a bit about what you've got planned for that? Or is that top secret? Uh, not really. I mean, I, I, I don't know what, which Zodiac sign it would be, but um, yeah, it will, it will be um, in 2022. Cool. Um, my birthday's in November, so uh, <laughs> you wanna, what's, uh, what's the, the hitty for Scorpio? Scorpio? Mm. Uh, I, I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a good question. I don't know. I mean, um, could be uh, something Peter? Yeah, all right. I'd go with that. Can you tell us a little bit um, about your future plans for the distillery and how many expressions? Okay, uh, okay definitely. I mean, as I said, today we are, uh, we are producing uh, close to 1.2 million litres annually. Um, our next goal is to um, double the capacity to uh, 2.4 million litres annually. So we have started working on that. Um, at the warehouses, we have close to uh, 4 million liters. Um, the next uh, target is to, um, to have close to 10 million liters of single march. Um, we have very big plans for uh, Nirvana. Um, maybe, uh, so every year we are targeting close to uh, 100,000 cases in India. And do you have any other really special casks that you're working with? Some original or uh, casks? Yes, I mean, the next release, uh, we are planning uh, to release a couple of Portuguese wine casks. I have uh, Madeira, I have Port Finish, uh, both Tawny as well as Vintage Port. Uh, this you would see maybe in uh, 2022 as well. Um, we're going to release uh, all Peter Dollar also. Wow. By this month, but, but by, by uh, this year end. So a lot of new expressions are lined up. Uh, of course, you know, um, I've just finished bottling the uh, Christmas edition 2021. Um, so this year I've used uh, Portuguese wine, wine cast finish uh, whiskey in it. We started in, the tradition started in 2018. Uh, 2018 had Oloroso finish, 19 had PX finish, 20 uh, had um, version of finish, 
2021, I've used uh, podcasts. Wow. We do like our podcast in Australia, so hopefully uh, we can get a little bit of that Christmas cast down here. Hint yeah, here. why not? Why not why indeed? Not? <laughs> <laughs> Well, while everybody's thinking about what was their favorite drink, I would personally like to say for, for everybody, um, uh, thank you so much for the, uh, for the tour, uh, Pankaj. That was, that was amazing, mate. It felt like we were on holiday. Thank you so much. Um, it was about as close as we can get to going on holiday these days. <laughs> without leaving uh that was brilliant thank you so much and gee i'd love to go there that would just be a wonderful experience and um yeah to to be in the in the place where the the product is made would be would be pretty wonderful and um yeah tasting some of those uh those barrel samples would be pretty special as well now for everybody tonight um Michael is going to, going to hang around and, and answer some questions for you. Um, Adam will put up the, the links tonight. We've given you all a discount on the four products we have. Love to see in the comments too, what was your favourite? The very approachable and I reckon one of the best value for money whiskies on the planet, which is, uh, is the Nirvana. The beautiful sweetness of the PX, that um, spicy nuttiness of the Oloroso and Wow, isn't Methuna something special too? A really great drink. So pop your favorite, pop your favorite uh, drink in the comments there. Um, Adam will put up all of the, um, the links to the website now. I said, we've got some, some great discounts there for you and thank you all for, for joining us uh, this evening. Now, Adam, what do we normally do this time of night? Oh. Well, we normally take a tally on whose favourite the whiskey was. Yeah. yeah. You got your pen ready? No. <laughs> I don't math, Todd. That's why I worked for you and became a distiller. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys. So please put your favourites into the, the comments there. And we'll get some feedback there for, for Michael. For those of you who want to like, jump on and, and grab a bottle, um, we'll have those, those special prices up for you for the next couple of hours. And if anybody has any questions for either for Pankaj or for, for Michael, please, please pop them in now. Um, really good question here, Michael, from, from Andrew. Mm -hmm. Uh, you mentioned you use Highland and Islay peat. Do you use them? Do you use both in all of your whiskies or separately? Okay. Um, we uh, we import, as I said, I mean we source our peat from two different regions, um, mainly because you know uh, these two peat has got different characteristics. We have a couple of peated expressions, uh, starting from edited. Edited is with a hint of peat. For edited, um, I've used peat from Highland because it is more mellower, more softer, yeah, and more minerally in character. Uh, then we have two hundred percent peated expressions. One is bottled at forty-six percent, known as Bowl. Uh, the other one is uh, known as peated select cask, which is bottled at fifty-five percent. The difference between Bowl and peated select cask is Bowl is five years old whereas a uh, peated select cask is seven. Uh, for bold, it is 100% Isla peat because it is more intense, more, um, uh, more medicinal, uh, you know, more, more sharper. Whereas again, uh, peated select cask has got peat from two different regions. So we have three different peated expressions having different peat components. Uh, the processing is done differently. Uh, uh, the peating not generally done in, during the winter in India. Uh, we use two different peats uh, for malting, uh, processed separately, 
Uh, mashing is done separately, distilled separately, matured in different casks. Only during the blending, both of the whiskies are used. So everything is done separately. Only during the blending, uh, I mix it. Does everyone who wanted to say their favorite whiskey already put it in the chat? Um, I am mean, actually in the process of the tally. We forgot to tell everybody too that it's a Paul John party for us. Every single thing from Paul John's on special as well on the, on the website. We do like a Paul John party, let's be honest. We can't get to go, we're gonna bring it to you. Michael, I'd like to let you know it's about five degrees in Hobart today. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what's the temperature in Goa today? Uh, I mean, Goa, we don't have winter, um, you know. Um, Rub it in. Today, I think it is, well. it's around 24, though it is raining, it is 24 degrees. Um, Goa, we don't have winter, but we have three, three seasons that is hot, hotter and hottest. <laughs> so... <laughs> Oh. So we are, we are, we are, it's, it's not very really hot. It is pleasant for Indian standards. Yeah, I guess you don't know the expression, put on your Ugg boots and put your puffy on too. I think it's called the Tassie tuxedo down here, Todd. The Tassie tuxedo indeed. Um, yes, it, it, it's not warm, Michael. It is whiskey weather in Tasmania at mm -hmm. the moment. But Do you think, Todd, uh, Mithano, Mithano kind of tasted like a Tasmanian whiskey? More to, I mean, uh, more than more than PX and Oloroso. Really good question. Um, I know we talked about that a lot uh, mm -hmm. five years ago, that um, Australian whiskies had a very big cask influence. Um, mm -hmm. I think the Oloroso cask in particular, but we, we don't have many. There's only a couple of people that are that are experimenting with virgin oak. So that's a, yeah, that's a really big compliment to you and what you've been able to achieve with that whiskey. Um, I think Brook Laddick have done some great work with virgin oak, uh, but this is a mm -hmm. beautiful whiskey. It's so big, it's, um, yeah, very long. So congratulations to you and your team, just rewards. <clears throat> You want to know the, the totals? Go on, mate. Well, uh, third place, nearly by an absolute hair, is the PX cask. Second place, of course, is the Oloroso, um, but again, only by a hair. But uh, fairly well in the lead is the Mithana. So, yeah, as expected, I suppose. Mithana was the favourite. Wow, what a surprise. <laughs> it's bloody exceptional. Does that mean we all agree with the man in the hat? <laughs> what have we come to? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> well, on, the, on this particular issue, yes. <laughs> on this one. Yeah. Before we leave, uh, leave everybody to have a chat with Michael tonight, uh, on behalf of, of Destination Sellers, uh, and Adam and Chris and myself, we have some people to thank. Um, thank you to, to South Trade, to, to Andy and Adam, if they're here tonight. Thanks guys. Thank you for, for bringing this beautiful product back into our, into our shop and uh, entrusting us to, to give it some love. Uh, thank you to everybody at home for joining us. Hopefully it's warmer wherever you are. Uh, <laughs> but gee, it's good whiskey weather down here, I can tell you. Uh, and thank you, Michael. Um, and all the, the beautiful whiskies that you produce. Um, we, we've certainly loved it now for, for it's been a five year romance. Can you believe it? <laughs> That's, um, you know. And we hope to, to continue the, the support down here in Australia. Thank you. <clears throat> thanks, Rod. Thanks for having us. You know, we look forward to have many more sessions like this. Yeah, hopefully a few more in person, mate. That'd be nice. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Michael's going to stick around now. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Adam's going to unmute everybody. Here, you're all you're crazy. And uh, we
we hope to see you all again online or if you can make it to Tassie in person, that'd be wonderful. Thank you for joining us and hang around for a chat.